Amen. Are you ready to worship? Amen. Have you had a good day? Yes. If you say no, I'm going to say, are you still breathing? And if you say yes, you just told a lie. But I just want to welcome you. I, I, I think every time I remember the scripture that tells us that every time we assemble to worship, the Holy Spirit is waiting on us to come worship. So he's always here. He's always got blessings to pour out. The, the pastors come to deliver what God has sent for us. We are supposed to receive what God sent for <laughs> us and rejoice in it. So let's, let's just say a prayer and give thanks. Father, God, in the name of Jesus, we come ready to give you honor and to give you praise. God, as we look around this room, we see brothers, we see sisters who are going through what we call struggles. But God, there's not one that are going through a struggle of any kind that you have deserted. You promised God you would never leave us. You will never forsake us. And God, you promised that you would always take care of every need that we ever had or ever bring to you. So we pray tonight, God, that as our hearts are open, you anoint the pastor to bring the message. And God, help us to say, God, here am I. Send me. And God, help us to deliver just what you sent us. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us pray. Good evening, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity to come into your house and offer you worship and praise and provide funds to keep your work moving in this community through our church. We thank you for the offering we're about to collect, and we thank you for using it for your work and your glory. Amen.
Let's pray, O Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's a beautiful Lord and over this offering and guide it and direct us and use it in our kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. wonderful hope we have what a glorious God that we serve that he has given us that kind of peace to know that no matter what goes on he's already there everything is already taken care of we can just go on let us pray father God I thank you for this evening I thank you Lord for the blessing that you have given us to again come into your presence. Lord, let us come with thanksgiving in a heart that is broken and contrite. Father, let us feel of your grace and Lord of your love. And Lord, we ask you, O oh God, that everything in this house tonight be done to your glory and honor. And Master, 
I pray that, Lord, that you would strengthen in each and every heart. If there be one in here that is in that valley of decision, that place where they're not sure, God, give them the reassurance of your spirit right now. Let your healing and saving grace, Father, permeate the very place that we are assembled. And Lord, we'll be so careful to give your name all praise, honor, and glory for every touch, every blessing rendered in the precious, holy, and glorious name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. to share with you tonight a couple of things. I want to tell Jody and the band, y'all good. Uh, we, Jody and I have a, a, a code that we use when we talk to one another and I can't see him from over there and he won't lean over so <laughs> all those times like there you go. And at times that I don't see I still do. Y'all good Chris. Thank y'all. I want to tell Richard I thank him with all my heart for the word that he's been bringing. I'm telling you, if there's ever been a faithful servant, he is one. And uh, I don't have any reservations about him being in this pulpit and sharing the word of God. So, Richard, thank you. All my heart. Amen. And when you get your next church, I'll fill them for you. <laughs> I want to share with you a couple of things real quick. I don't want to mess Richard's time up. October the, the 2nd um, was a life-changing experience for me. Uh, that morning I was getting ready to go to the hospital. Tish was having surgery and I was getting dressed. And I had finished dressing and was fixing to put on my rings and my watch and I got dizzy. And um, I fell. I don't remember anything except put my head down on my dresser um, and the next thing I do know I woke up on the floor don't know how long I stayed out I've never passed out before but I couldn't see my watch I had it on but my fell in such a way that my watch was turned and I couldn't see it so I laid there all day and um, I told the girls one, one of the things I remember is that at some point I couldn't, I couldn't roll, I couldn't move. I remember thinking, well, at least I'm not paralyzed because I moved my feet and I moved my arms. And I don't know why I thought that thought had nothing to do with anything. I don't know why I thought it, but I did. When I got to the hospital, uh, they did all the tests and I think they did a hundred tests on me that night. I think they wanted to make a lot of money. And uh, they told me I had a broken neck and um, I could have been dead or I could have been paralyzed. And God didn't want either one of those. And Amen. they life flighted me to Jackson, to uh, Savannah. And um, we had five people waiting on me when I got there in uh, the ER intensive care, uh, ER trauma. And anyway, they worked on me, and, and um, the next day they moved me up to ICU trauma and they worked on me and uh, I got the same report that I had broken my neck and that I have to wear this collar for 12 weeks which will be the week of Christmas 
before That's Christmas. Huh? The week before Christmas. The week before Christmas, that would be my Christmas present this year, is to be able to take this thing off. <laughs> but I have to wear it 24-7, and it's very uncomfortable, especially at nighttime. I don't sleep well because, well, just imagine, I can't, I can't have a pillow, and it's always pressed on the back of my head, and I keep a headache, and it keeps my hair messed up back here. <laughs> I can't stand that. But nevertheless, um, I go this coming Friday to see my neck doctor to let him see what kind of progress I'm making. If, it, if the bone's healing, we're in good shape. I'll keep it on another however long and maybe get it off. I don't know. We're, I want you to pray that I get a good report this coming Friday. I need a good report. Maybe he can lack. I take this off once a day, and that's after I take my shower. And the girls and the boys will come, and I have to lay down flat, and they take the back off and put another one on, take the front off, and put another one on. So I'm out of my brace for about 20 seconds a day, and that's it. And everything I do um, hurts. That's why Stephanie asked you not to hug me, <clears throat> not to hug me, and it's still that way. Honestly, because I can't turn my head, I have to, I have to rotate with you. But if I if I turn the wrong way or do something the wrong way, it is excruciating pain. And so we're gonna we're gonna need to hold off on that until I can get through this. Um, I want to hug as much as y'all do, if not more, because that's one thing you miss in my case. Now, I tell y'all that to tell you something else. I, I stand here tonight. I want to be in the pulpit. I, I really do. And um, my, my biggest problem right now is looking down or moving my head down. If I'm laying in bed, the only way I can read now is to pull my iPad up here <laughs> because I can't bend my head and I can't rotate good. But as soon as I'm able, I'll be back up here in the pulpit. Until then, we're in capable hands. I'm not worried about it. The, de the deacons have done a wonderful job on Wednesdays. I, I've really been pleased with the deacons. Uh, they didn't tell life stories. They preached the word of God, and they, they did and really did a good job. So they'll keep working on that until we transition back in. Now, I want to tell you that I thank God that I broke my neck. And I can say to you that way because of what I'm fixing to tell you. Uh, that night when I was here, here in Waycross, I knew there was something that the girls weren't telling me. I just didn't know what it was, and I asked them. Is there something you're not telling me? And they said, well, Daddy, we're telling you everything we know. And in a few minutes, the ER doctor came in, and he looked at Stephanie. He said, have y'all told him yet? And uh, I knew then they hadn't told me yet. And she said, no, we're waiting on you to confirm it. He said, well, it's confirmed. You have a mass on your right kidney. And never dreamed something like that. But when they got to Savannah, the next day, I think it was, they brought in a, a cancer doctor, and he talked to me about it and told me that I did have a, a mass over on my right kidney. It's a 2.4. 3.4. is the size of it. I don't know what that means, but Smart. it's a 3 medium. It's a 3.4 on his kidney. And he said, I needed to see my cancer doctor here in Waycross. So when we got back, went to see Dr. John, wonderful doctor. And he talked with me about it. Uh, he said the mass is there, but there's also something showing up on my ribs, on the bottom of my rib, which is right near the mass. And there was something showing up chest. in my chest. And later on, we found out also the lymph nodes. And he wanted me to go to a, a doctor in Savannah that does biopsies. It was a friend of his, so he called me while we were sitting there and set it up. And I went to see him, and they were looking for hot spots, is what they call them. And the doctor said that you had the PET scan done. You didn't go see that. You had the PET scan done. Oh, yes. I had a PET scan done here to determine if I had hot spots, cancer. And the doctor and in Savannah, I didn't go there. He called me on the phone. That's what it was. They sent the they sent the uh, PET scan to him. He called me on the phone, a uh, face call, and said that I, there was nothing in the lymph nodes, nothing in my chest, and nothing on this rib. It was it, none of it was there. There were no hot spots in my body, those places. 
but he said, you do have a hot spot on your kidney. Um, he said, you need to go back and see your doctor here and see what you're going to do about it. So we went back to see him, and the hot spot, the cancer is in this mass on my kidney. So I asked him, I said, is it in the mass or on the mass? And he said, it's on the mass. So as far as we know, it's outside the kidney on top of this mass. He, I'm going next to MD Anderson Cancer Clinic in Jacksonville. There, Dr. Jaw has a oncologist, no, he has a urologist that would do whatever is necessary now on this. Um, they, point, they haven't made the appointment with me yet, we're still waiting on them, but that doctor will decide how they're going to get this mass out and to what extent they have to do it. I don't know what it's going to be. I'm not worried about it. Um, I don't know what it's going to be. So as soon as I get that message from them, I'll go down there and we'll see what kind of procedure we're going to do and what it entails. I wanted to tell you this because it's easy to get rumors started when you have more than two people involved. And I don't want any rumors out here. We purposely did not tell anyone, including my family, because we didn't know what it was. And I, we decided that we'd wait until we had it confirmed, and then I'd tell them, because when you tell somebody you, you may have cancer, they always think the worst, and I didn't want that happening. So once we found out for sure, I called David and Greg and Becky and told them. And. Um, but I know rumors get started, and I want y'all to know I'm I'm uh, I'm in good shape considering everything. I really am. I thank God that I broke my neck, because if I hadn't have broken my neck, we'd have never found this. I had no symptoms whatsoever. Doctor Jaw asked me all these questions. Did you do so and so? And had no symptoms whatsoever. So I would have never known that I had this until it grew to the point that it became a problem with my body, and then it could have been too late. So I thank God I broke my neck. God does things in strange ways. He really does. And I'm, I'm a grateful man today that I'm alive and that I'm as well off as I am because I am good. Um, want to be back doing, I can't drive uh, until they release me in December. I can't, I'm stuck at the house. The girls lock me in and leave. And I, I can't stand it. I can't stand being alone like that. I can't stand not being able to drive. Um, I can't stand not being here. I got a lot of I can't stands, but I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be back, and, and I want y'all to pray for me that the procedure of whatever this is will be an easy procedure. There's three or four things they've told me they may have to do or they could do. Uh, we won't know. So pray that this will be taken care of in a simple matter, and I want y'all to continue to pray for me. I need it. I need it. You're welcome to call me. You're welcome to come see me. I heard the other day that somebody in the church said that you couldn't come to my house unless you were invited and you had to be a special person to do that. That's not true. I, you know, people love to lie, I guess. My door, my house is open. I'd love to see you. You can come. Stay just a little while. I don't stay a long time because it hurts to hold my head up a long time. But come see me. I thank all of you for the food you sent, the things you've done. It's been awesome. It's really been awesome. I'm by myself again. Uh, the girls finally turned me loose. Uh, good part about it, I have to see one of my girls every day because they have to change this. So I do get to see them every day. But that's a good thing. That's your sons. Well, my sons. I mean, yeah, I'm telling you, yeah. I want to give somebody a word of encouragement this morning because I want to tell you just how great our God is and how much you need to truly rely on him. That night at the hospital, no lie, this is what the doctor came in and told Chris and I. Well, the bad news is your daddy has broke his neck. That's been confirmed. But we also found a spot in his lungs and his rib and in his mass, and I've confirmed with the radiologist, and he has cancer. That's exactly verbatim what the doctor told me. And I looked at my husband, and I about lost it because I was like, there's what? Like, I told him, I said, back up, you know, like, back up. So, but that night I looked at Chris and even on the way down there, I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not accepting that. Like he's had no symptoms, nothing whatsoever. I'm not even worried about the mass right now or anything else because I know I serve God. But that's just to tell y'all when you go to the hospital, 
don't listen to these doctors unless you have confirmation because they'll tell you a lie in a heartbeat. So our God took over. He proved. He gave me peace about it. He's given Tish and I peace about it, and he's going to be just fine. But don't trust the, don't trust the doctors. Trust God. I have two wonderful sons. I would never leave them out. They're, they're right there every day, one of them, uh, to help me. I can bathe myself, but I can't do any of this. They helped me until I could got where I could bathe myself. They were there doing that and putting my <coughs> shoes and my socks on. and They're just like my own, and they are. So I've got wonderful sons and a wonderful family and a church family that I love dearly. So I haven't told you lately, but I love you. I thank God for you, and uh, I'll be back as soon as I can get back. Until then, keep praying. Well, now you know. But it is good to know that God knows everything about us. I, I'm always encouraged by that. I know that although something may be over here saying it's this and so, I know that God has all these other things under control as well. And we're just praying for our pastor. Thank God for him every day. And uh, he's in our prayer every day. And uh, now we know some more to be praying. Thank God for his goodness and grace. But we appreciate the goodness of the Lord. And I tell you, there are things, uh, for one thing, I'm glad Lexi made it back tonight. See, I'm up here. And Tegan sits right there, and I know that y'all cannot see him. That was the worst-looking face on a human being that I have ever seen in my entire days. But I knew he was here tonight because the glare that was coming off of his teeth We appreciate you, son, very much. <laughs> Love you dearly. What a wonderful, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful bunch of young people we have in this church. Just wonderful. But if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me to the seventh chapter of Matthew. Matthew 7. I won't keep you very long. Because I know I've got to be running close, uh, which is great. Because we're going to enjoy the blessing of God as we're here. Amen. I tell you, I, I just love God. Matthew, the seventh chapter. We're going to start with the seventh verse. It's a familiar scripture. And when I, really, when I get in a place sometimes where I really don't have an answer in my own self. And I've, I've listened, as Sister Stephanie was talking about, I've listened to doctors and all of these learned folk, and I appreciate every one of them. But I come back, and I love that this comes back to my remembrance. And this scripture in the seventh chapter in the seventh verse of Matthew simply says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now I know that to the world that's a mystery. That's an enigma. How in the world can we come along and say that all we have to do is ask, seek, and knock. Uh, that's, uh, that's impossible. Well, I know God. And I say I know God because I've seen God's work. I've seen God take the impossible and turn it completely around. 
I told you about my little cousin had bone cancer at six or seven years of age. Little bitty fellow. They were going to take his arm off. That was the only option they had. And then they had no assurance that it could be given that that was going to do the job. But they didn't understand one thing at the children's hospital here in Jacksonville. And that was that prayer was fixing to start. It was about to start. We of us that were down there in that hospital, there in the chapels and in the waiting room and so forth, we were praying. But there was prayer started all over this country and some places outside of the country. There were saints of God that said, a five, six, seven-year-old child does not need to die. Because there's a God in heaven, and he has a purpose in his life. And when we all prayed, and they came in and came to get Scott, and they told him that, told everybody, well, we've done all the tests, we've sent everything off, we don't know what else to do, we've gone as far as we can go, there's nothing left to do. We've done the biopsies, we've done everything else, sent everything even as far as New York. That was the final word right there, the New York. And it came back, it's cancer, and we've got to do something. And they rolled that little fella out. I mean, he's just a little thing. And they rolled him out to carry him into surgery. Now, that's where you stop. That's where you have to come back and you have to take the word of God and it has to become alive to you. You can either believe it or you don't have to. You can have confidence in it or you do not have to. You can trust the word of God or you do not have to. But somewhere down the line, if somebody's going to get a prayer through, they're going to have to trust God. Everything. They rolled that little fella out. We were all just broken up. But prayer was still going on, Chris. Nothing was stopped. Nothing had hindered the communication between us and God. It wasn't but just a short period of time. Here they come rolling Scott back in. This is supposed to take several hours. We had gone, been gone 30 minutes, it seemed like. And they come rolling him back in. And everybody is in bewilderment. You know how? I imagine that crowd that was there that day that the man had the withered hand, withered arm. And when Jesus told him to stretch it out, and he reached out, and it was made whole. Could you imagine what that crowd looked like and what they were thinking? We had confidence. We had faith. We had everything else. But not, we weren't looking for that. We weren't looking for the fullness of God to come out and to step in on the scene. And when the doctor came in, we're wondering, what in the world? Scott's up. He's just as happy as he can be. Little fellow never had a one-second problem with the whole time that he was there. We were the ones that were the mess. And when they rolled him back in, they put him in that bed. He just happy he had to have been a crib type thing where he wouldn't fall out. But he was just sitting up there happy as he could be. What went on? Well, when we got in there, we decided to do one more test. One more test before we cut. Thank God. He said, when we did the test, and we did the scan, and that cancer that I had cut into 
and held in my hand when I took that piece of biopsy out of there. He said, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years. I've handled unbelievable amounts of cancer. I know cancer when I have it in my hand. I know how it feels. I know how it looks. I know what cancer is. And he said, when we got in there, and we took the pictures one more time, that cancer had almost completely gone. They said, you can take that boy home. And you know what the doctor said? Somebody got a prayer through. I didn't do anything. Medicine didn't do anything. Nobody was able to, to do anything. I know what it was. I saw it with my own eyes. I felt it with my own hands. I know what I'm talking about. But there's a God up above. And somebody got a prayer through. Amen. Amen. That part of ask, seek, and knock. That's not a falsehood. That's not, I, and from that moment on, that truly became alive unto me, Brother Danny. I said, I can't doubt God. I can't sit there and say, I, well, God can't do that. I've seen God do the impossible. I've seen God take it and take a child that is probably going to die in just a short period of time and bring him out, you can take him on home. And he's, 20, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 years old now, living in Atlanta. Oh, God love him for that. But anyway, <laughs> living up there with a wife and children of his own. Not so right down here in Jacksonville. But it did not matter. Somebody got a prayer through. Amen. The world may look at that, say there's nothing to it. You know, I, 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 and like I said, you can't argue with the devil. Don't argue with him. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't argue. You can't save anybody. You can't convince anybody they need the saving grace of Jesus Christ and his blood applied to their life. You cannot convince anyone of that. The only person who can do that is the Holy Spirit of God. And by the word of God, he will, that anointed word, he will reach into that life and he'll take that old stony heart and he'll change it and where he can touch it and God will change them. You can't do it on your own because God is the one that has all the power. Without him, nothing happens. But through him, all things do happen. It's an enigma to the world. And when you turn around, you say, For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And him, to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. I know people in every aspect, and this, this applies not only to the deep spiritual things, but this applies to every part of your life. Why not turn it all over to God? We're going to try to trust Him because I have cancer. We're going to, have, we're going to try to trust Him uh, because whatever. Why not trust Him for the headache you have? Why not trust him for the finance that you don't have? Amen? Why not trust God and put everything at the feet of God and say, God, I can't handle it, but I know one who can. And my trust and my confidence, I'm standing here asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking with everything I have. God, I need a deliverance. Praise God. I need a movement of God. Whatever it is. And Oh, yes, amen. Praise God. We're going to seek and find the things of God. Why in the world do we want to hold back? 
Why do we want to sit there and say, Lord, I, I know that you can do the big things, but forget about the little bitty things. He said the little foxes are the ones that spoil the vine. Praise God, it's the little small things. It's the little things that'll spoil. Hey, all you have to have is one bad apple in a barrel, and the whole thing will rot. Why not get the bad apple out? Why not trust God with it? Lord, I don't know how I'm going to handle it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yes, I know what to do. Get on your face before God and put it in his hands. Leave it alone. We come to the altar. A lot of folk come to the altar, and I appreciate that. I thank God. Don't ever stop. Keep coming. After a while, somebody, you might hear Brother Danny preach a message one time and, and where he says, when you come down to the altar, why don't you just leave it there? And you might actually believe it. When you bring that petition before the Lord, why carry it back to the house with you? Leave it with God. You can't handle it. You've already said you can't. Nobody's going to help you out. But thank God, when we leave it with him, everything works out. Now, let me tell you something about that. It may not work out the way you think it will. Amen? My pastor fell down. Broke his neck. Broke his neck. Laid there. For I don't know how long. We didn't hear all the rest of the story. Probably because of none of our business. But inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> yeah. But he laid there for I don't know how long. And they were, they were there at that hospital. As Sister Stephanie was just telling. They were there waiting to hear the bad news. And the bad news was that he had a broke neck. Now what are we going to do about it? And the C2, that's right here at the base of your skull. That's not a good place. You know how many quarters of an inch that is from severing your spine? But they were expecting to hear one thing. And Lord of mercy, they opened the floodgate. But you know, we don't always know what's right. We don't always know what God has planned. I'll assure you, if Brother Danny, if they'd have come along there and one of the angels would have put their arm around Danny and put, while he was trying to put his rings on and said, probably be best for you if you fell down here and broke your neck. Danny would say, where, where the supervisor angel? I need to talk to somebody else. <laughs> you need to get the supervisor on the phone. <laughs> You ever had to talk to them? Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, we don't want to be talking about me falling down here, breaking my neck. Are you crazy? That was the best thing. Thank you for that testimony. That was the best thing because it uncovered more things that probably could have been more disastrous. But when you have... Everyone that asketh receiveth. I love that. You ask of God, you're going to receive. You may not get what you want, but you may have to take what God gives. And let me clue you in on something. Whatever that is that God gives, you're going to stand back and smile bigger than Tegan. You're going to think that's the best thing that ever happened. Amen? Amen? Just let me have the will of God. Let me, you know, I, I've, I've told people, I hear people over there, they talk about all these things and all the riches and, and they, oh, we have all these houses and we have all these things and all that. And I look at them and I go, I thank the Lord for what God has given me. Amen. Because you want me to tell you what God's given me? Probably everything that I can stand. 
I don't care about all the riches of the world. People could come by and say, look, we want to give you all this, give you all that. I don't need it. I don't give it to somebody that needs it because I don't. I thank God for that. I'm not, I'm not alone. When I lay down at night, Brother Farrell, I lay my head down. Praise God, I am not alone. I am in the presence and in the bosom of God. He is there. I lay I close my eyes, and when I close my eyes, I am asleep. Now, you can call it whatever you want to. Some people call it the sleep of the dead, but I, I just call it good going to sleep. But I don't have to worry. I'm not studying the things of this life because they don't mean anything to me. I have resolved a long time ago that I've got what I'm going to get. <laughs> Amen. And just go ahead and be satisfied with it because I see it. And thank God for it. I thank God for that resolution. I thank God that I have resolved to uh, accept that and to know that and to believe that and to look towards God for everything that I have need of. Amen. I told you this morning, I thank God for a praying wife. I do, because if there's something that comes up, she will start a prayer program going on. She'll have everybody on the phone. Doris, I just had a flat tire on the bicycle. That's all it was. Yeah, but we need to be praying about that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Whatever it is. She'll have a prayer committee going on, and y'all not having prayer meeting tomorrow morning. I was supposed to announce that. But he said, Or of what man is there of you whom his son asked bread will give him a stone? What kind of man is that? I tell folk all the time, don't tell me anything because I'll tell it from the pulpit. <laughs> Amen. Brother Cribs, you're not out of it. <laughs> he and I were talking one day. Oh, Lord. <laughs> ah! And we were talking, and something came up that Darlene was out there working in the buildings and doing whatever. I don't know what all it was. And we were discussing some of the pitfalls of all that and the trials and the tribulations of anything that's not hunting related. And he turned around, and he made a five- word statement I am proud of her I am proud of her and let me tell you something he didn't say it with a smile on his face he didn't say it with his eyes batting like a frogs in a hailstorm But he said it. I am proud of her. And I said, that's a wonderful thing. And I said, I'll remember that. Because we don't ever know what things the devil is going to throw our way. We're still in the world. He's the prince and the power of the air. But I thank God that his children his children have his blessing upon them. And I, I can affirm that and attest to it because on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Elisha and Moses were there with Jesus, and you know the mindset that the Jews had about Moses, still have. 
They said, oh, it's a good thing that we are here. We need to build three tabernacles. One to Moses, one to Elias, and one to Jesus. Equal. The Bible said that all of a sudden, things got quiet. I could imagine a darkness settled down upon that mountain. And then a voice from heaven came down. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when everything changed, Moses and Elias were gone. Nobody was standing there but Jesus. Hear ye him. And because of that, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I can uh, think, bring that right back to the fact that I am a child of the king. Praise the Lord. I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. All the things that are attested to him, all the blessings that are given unto him, flow through him unto me. I am not a red-headed stepchild. I belong to God. Block everything, everything about it. I belong to God. He has set everything else aside and called me his child. I don't have to worry. I'm not going to sit back and say, well, I, I don't, I'm not sure whether God will perform this or whether God will do it. No, I've already seen what God can do. I've already seen what God will do. I'm not going to sit back and say, well, you know how it is. No, I know how it is. He is able. Your son asked for a bread. You going to give him a stone? No. Your child comes to you. Now, I don't know about the neighbor's youngins. But if one of your children come to you, I've heard them before. I've heard mothers before. What about Junior? Well, he just got convicted. Convicted of what? Killing 50 people, cold-blooded, being seen, known about it. Everybody, and it's all over with. And that poor, sainted mother, he's, he's a good boy. He's never done anything wrong. Hmm. That's the way God looks at us. And he can look at us that way because of one thing. That poor mother cannot change the circumstance. But see, when God looks at us, he sees us as murderers. He sees us as liars. He sees us as thieves. He sees us of all manner of evil. But today... When he looks upon us, the only thing he can see is the blood. Praise God. Praise God. The only thing he can see is the blood, and because of that blood, Sister Carolyn, we are made whole, and we are called sons of God. Thank God. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We cry, Abba, Father. Why? Because he is our Father. Because he sees us as his own. Blood bought. Praise God. I have four minutes and I hadn't need about 30. And when a man is there, or what man of, the, of you are there, if his son asks bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks a fish, we'll give him a serpent. But listen to this. If ye then being evil, my children come to me. My daughter's just about got me in bankruptcy. No, she doesn't. I'm sick. I'm just kidding. 
for whatever she needs, I'm going to try to move heaven and earth to try to get it. I'm going to do whatever's necessary to try to get for her. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Brother Clark, I don't know if I should be asking for that or not. Ask. Ask. Seek. Find. Know. Don't let God hang out behind in the bushes out yonder somewhere and you never call on him. Turn your face towards him. And what you'll find is when you try to turn your face towards him, he was always standing right here. And all he was whispering in your ear through his spirit Call on me, speak to me, ask of me, seek of me, knock and I'll open that door before you that you will never be able to receive all that I have for you. What is it, Lord, that I need? I have no need. I have Jesus. Praise God. I don't lack. There's nothing that's without. I'd shut it down. I don't lack a thing, but I have everything that I need because I have Jesus. And when I get to doubting and I get to fretting and I get to fearing, I go back and I think about those things right there. And I think about that little fella. He's going to die. They gave him less than 10% to live. Somebody got a prayer for you can take him on home. We've done all we can do. <laughs> we don't need to do anything else. We need to have that kind of faith. We have people in this church, not just our pastor, but others that are in dire need of a touch from God. Let's believe God. I know what the doctors say. I know just how bad it is. I know what goes on. I've seen them. I've seen them do their best work, and I thank God for them. But let's believe God. Let's believe God. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you, Master, for your goodness and grace. And I thank you, dear Father, that your blessing, O oh Lord, has been in this house. Father, we've felt your spirit. Lord, we've felt the power of your word. And God, strengthen us right now undergird us with your truth and blessing. Father, be with us. Go with us, O oh God. Give us the encouragement to come before the throne of grace, to bring our petitions there, Lord. But God, give us the grace to leave them there and know that you have it all taken care of. Father, I ask you right now that your blessing be real in each heart and, Lord, each life. And Father, we'd be so careful to give your name all praise, honor, and glory for every blessing rendered in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Don't move. 